everyone. So today we're going to be talking about how here at Foreign Intelligence, we are making complex R forecast applications into production using Argo workflow. So just to give a little bit of a background, we started as an economics consultancy company that focused mainly on time series data. And we are now, and we have already a first version developing what we call forecast as a service. So the idea is that people with little or no background on statistics or economics can run analysis very sophisticated, running from traditional statistical algorithms up to auto ML functions. And they can do that with just a few clicks. And we also focus on having very good front-end applications where the person can easily access all of the results and have a good understanding of what's going on in there. As we started to shift from consultancy focus to a technology company, we had a lot of challenges. The first one was that we were used to using R in all of our developments. So if you look at the background of our scientists, data scientists, they are mostly from statistics, economics, engineers, and use R on a daily basis. So we needed to bring R to production. We needed to use that team know-how that we had. And we also wanted to do this while optimizing our cost. In the same line, we wanted to have simpler and faster deploys. Because in the beginning, it would take hours, maybe on a Friday night, a Friday evening, and we knew that it was something that we needed to do. But one thing that we're not willing to let go is the reliability of our results. We really focus on having accurate forecasts and while bringing interpretability to, of the results to our clients. But how did we get there? So our data scientists working on different projects would see the need of a different approach or a different methodology that was new or something like that. And they would implement this in R, writing functions and put it in, putting it inside our pipeline. The idea was that once you have this in the pipeline, other teammates could help you debug and also use on their projects. But the problem that we faced sometimes was that there was no versioning control. Maybe I was working on a version that I debugged and a teammate was working on a previous one. We started doing super repos where we put everything in there and we would have maybe version one, two, three, but there was no actual versioning control. At the point that we started doing that, thing, doing that, things got a lot better for us. So another big issue that we faced was that we were running the codes locally. And with all of the time series that we had, maybe we were running a thousand of them with very exhaustive cross-validation. It would take a lot of time. And once you find a bug, you have to start all over. And we saw the need to go to the cloud. It was something that we couldn't postpone anymore. Once we lift and shifted our code to the cloud, there were a lot of gains because we noticed that the productivity of our data scientists grew a lot. We also were a lot more sure about the reliability of the results. We knew that it, all, that it went through our entire pipeline from pre-processing, feature selection, modeling, and post modeling, all of the analysis that we have, we were sure that they were being done properly. And we're, we did all of that using R. If you look at the way that we used to do things, we used R for API, orchestrating, outputting, and communicating with Google Cloud. Even our front end was developed in R. We also had a monolithic structures. If I was running maybe 97, it's a very classic case for us. We were running 97 time series and I sent the request via API. We would run things on batch, so we would send that 97 jobs to one virtual machine, and we had four at the time. We had a big problem with lines, but still from running locally to going to the cloud, we had a great improvement, but we started having new problems with getting too big for this structure being run in R. And that's when we started implementing the new infrastructure using Argo and the Kubernetes. So as the lines started to grow and the jobs would take a lot of time to run, we started looking for new solutions. As our focus started shifting, scalability became a bottleneck. So we needed to be able to scale what we're doing so we could grow. And what we wanted to do, we wanted our code to be generic and accurate. So we want to run as different time series as possible. We wanna have great forecasts 
but we want to do it fast. How to make it work in an efficient cloud environment? Should we keep using R? Should we change both infra and algorithms? That's what we had to decide at that point. At this point, we decided to look at the pros and cons of R, of keeping using R. The advantages were first that we had a legacy. All of our codes were written in R. We were very comfortable doing that. The team know-how, even from developers to users, they all knew how to use R very fluently. And we also have the fact that R is largely used in academics. We focus on having new implementations and most of the statistical new implementations are available in R very fast. So we could have new approaches, new methodologies within clicks. And the drawbacks are that there's very limited native support to cloud environments. And once we started needing help from other developers outside of this academic world, they were not familiarized with R. They used more Python or other languages, so we had to make sure that we were on the same page. We get to the point where we map our solution needs. We needed scalability, so we need to be able to run lots of time series at the same time and also long ones and within, be ready within a few minutes. We need a resilience. We need to have some retry strategy. We need a decoupling, dockerization, cost efficiency, monitoring, and microservice friendly. So next, we're gonna talk a little bit about the solutions that we showed in the previous slide. And we start with the decoder step. Once a job is sent via API, it goes to the decoder, which divides the jobs into different VMs. It parallelizes and scales up the, job, the machines on demand. At this point, you can see that we kept R for all of the modeling, but we are introducing Python in here. The decoder is done in Python, which is now sent to different virtual machines. So what we did at this point is that we fit our sessions in small images. We, start, we took that big images and we divided it so we could be faster and lighter. It's good to mention that we got a lot of help from the R minimal mm -hmm. community. They helped us build a specific version that we needed. And once we started working with the images, we faced a very non-challenge for our users, is that we had package dependencies that conflicted. So maybe I needed a specific version of a package for one package, and for another, I would need a different one. And with those conflicts, we realized that maybe it was best for us to build our own image. And with these images, we decided to use as little external packages as possible to avoid conflicts, let to leave our image lighter and give us more flexibility inside the implementations. So this lighter image helped us decrease our building time from three hours to five minutes. It was a great plus for us. So now Pedro is going to continue the presentation talking about our architecture solution. Thanks, Natalia. Uh, so after we optimized our, uh, our image, we had to decide how the new architecture would look like. Coming from the previous dimensions architecture, we decided that the easier approach was to turn it into a cloud-run application. So we wrapped all the R pipeline in a, in a Python API and we plugged it uh, after the decoder. What it did for us is that it greatly increased our performance. The, uh, all the jobs and the pipeline was running much faster, but we had uh, some issues with cost control. We had some problems with cost control, so we decided to change the focus and look for another solution. So that's where we landed on Kubernetes, which is a much more uh, modern approach to this kind of pipeline. And uh, for that, we decided to use the Argo workflow. What Argo did for us is that it uh, enabled all the microservice-like st structure uh, with a scalable and more uh, cost-controlled architecture, all running in an isolated ecosystem. So we can run uh, Python processes and R processes, all that within Argo, and Argo will deal with all the communication with the Google Cloud Platform. Regarding the costs, Argo, Argo allows us to uh, customize our clusters and our pods, our nodes, to uh, know how much we will spend uh, in certain uh, situations. In we can predefine all memory usages and how much machines we were, we're running. Uh, regarding the resilience part, what uh, what it, it allowed us to do is to implement retry and failure strategies and uh, disaster recovery uh, tools as well. 
and also the application became stateless and much more fault tolerant, which all of that uh, combined formed a much more bulletproof architecture regarding the tracking. I think it was one of the, our biggest improvements was that now we have uh, completely decoupled log files. So when an error occurs, we know exactly where the error is. So if it's an infrastructure error or a pipeline error, and uh, that allows us to call the right people to solve the right problems. It provides us with a lot of less time debugging and looking for what exactly is the problem and what uh, is occurring. And also we implemented real-time monitoring uh, with Argo workflow dashboards and Prometheus and Grafana. One of the biggest accomplishments that Argo brings to, to us is that it allows us to move much more towards a microservice approach and uh, it allows us to plug more and more applications and makes the, all the pipeline much less uh, language dependent. So for example, uh, we started everything in a pipeline with R. Now we have machine learning models in Python. We have deep learning models in Python. All that can work well with Argo uh, to build a, a pipeline that brings the best of both worlds. So it can have the best R can provide and the best Python can provide. We can have the latest implementations and the newest solutions. Also, what, what it brings to us is that it allows us to have multiple processes with continuous deployment and continuous integration with much more reliability. And now moving on to how our architecture actually looks. Uh, this is how it works. Uh, our user, uh, it can be both uh, an external user uh, or an internal client, such as our data science teams. They can send their jobs uh, directly uh, to our forecast as a service, or they can use our created time series uh, that we provide both types of clients to uh, better improve their models. It will go through an API that will trigger uh, a pub sub event, then that will start all the process. So the client can send hundreds and hundreds of series at once. The, it will enter the decoder, the decoder will break, break it apart, send it to the mod, non modeling pipeline, and it will make all those processes using the Argo events to trigger all the Argo workflow events. Uh, so all the model will occur and it will output our uh, final result uh, and trigger all the events that send uh, the email to our client and uh, that let our front end, for example, know that the job is finished so the person can consume it both in their own uh, IDE or using our front end for post-processing. So with the architecture defined, we saw the need to set the parameters to allow it to scale in an efficient way. First of all, use Argo config map to limit the rate at which pods are created to avoid overloading the case API. We also limited the maximum number of incomplete workflows and the max total parallel workflows that can be executed at the same time to avoid using excessive resources. To mitigate IP exhaustion, we limited the maximum pods per node. And uh, now uh, with a dedicated MLOps team, we now have automated tests and deploys and builds using a plethora or of applications uh, which allowed us to finally reach our GitOps CI CD, which in turn also led to a much more uh, stable level of cost optimization and also uh, uh, designing tests for vulnerability in, in both containers and package dependencies. We are now running all our applications in pli private clusters with no external access at all and uh, all our processes run asynchronous. So we have as many uh, different series as memory allows us in a different virtual machine. So we are not locked to a one job per virtual machine. And I think to wrap it up, we also have uh, now uh, running it on a multi-region uh, private GKE cluster, which also brings more resiliency. So to wrap it up, uh, we, change for, from an uh, entirely built in our application in the cloud with third parties uh, packages doing the communication to a completely cloud native solution, uh, which is completely uh, independent from which code we're using in our process. And now we can plug in different applications and uh, work without any bound to which technology is trending at the moment. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you join us at the Q&A.